Good afternoon. My name is Claudio Canizares. I'm a professor of the electrical and computer engineering department, and I'm the executive director of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy, WISE, which is hosting this event, together with the Office of Research. We're welcome, we're happy to welcome our colleagues from uh, CNL. Uh, before I start, let me make a territorial acknowledgement as required. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. Sorry about that. Our main campus is situated in the Haldimand Tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards the reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within the Office of Indigenous Relations. In fact, we have within WISE, we have a, a, an, org, a, a, an, an initiative basically dealing with access uh, to energy. Uh, Ambika is with us, which is running this, this group or this initiative, which focuses precisely on remote, a good part of it will focus on remote communities. So we are very active in this particular area. So, <clears throat> Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to your presentation, a very timely topic. Uh, Lee Siddiqui leads CNL's Advanced Re uh, uh, Reactors Directorate. Uh, Ali has been with CNL for over 12 years, serving in various technical and management roles in the Science and Technical Mission and Corporate Office. As head of Directorate and Advanced Reactors, he leads both the staff and programs undertaking research crucial to speed, de speed development and deployment of advanced and small modular reactors in Canada. Ali leads a diverse team executing on CNL's clean energy vision, including serving federal clients, developing new commercials and T opportunities, and providing support for the SMR deployment project at CNL, which he'll be talking about now. His team <clears throat> His team has also developed CNL's clean energy demonstration, innovation, and research, CEDIR, initiative to advance the technological readiness of low carbon hybrid energy systems and help meet Canada's, Canada's, Canada's net zero goals, in which we are all involved, in one way or another. He currently represents CNL and Canada on a number of domestic and international working groups and committees. Holds a master's degree in aerospace engineer, engineering and is a professional engineer in Ontario. He'll be talking about, as you can see here, nuclear energy for sustainable in the future, small modular and advanced reactors, which is a very timely topic. Thank you for being here. Thank you for agreeing to make this presentation. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Claudio. Okay, thank you very much uh, for joining the talk today. Uh, as uh, Claudio said, that the title is Nuclear Energy for Sustainable Future, Small Modular and Advanced Reactors. And so my hope with this talk is to impart a little bit of uh, a current state of the world in terms of what's going on in Canada with SMRs and advanced reactors and, uh, and explain why I think that that's uh, really a crucial piece of a sustainable energy future. So before I jump into uh, my agenda, I, I do want to kind of note that the premise of this talk is really that energy is a core fundamental requirement for modern society and for full human flourishing. And so, of course, we're all looking for opportunities to find efficiencies, which is really important. But the reality is there's an enormous need for energy that's uh, more sustainable than what we currently use. Uh, and I'm going to dive in to show you uh, what I think nuclear energy can do to contribute to that sustainable energy future. So I'm going to start with a, just a primer on, on what is sort of nuclear energy uh, to make sure we're all at the same level. And then I'm going to dive into some details on what's going on in the landscape uh, in Canada, in particular around small modular and advanced reactors. Uh, some musings on, on what I would say are the most important uh, advantages and some perceived limitations for a new nuclear in Canada and around the world. And then uh, for the, the sort of second half of my talk, I'm going to really dive into more detail on what we're doing at Canadian nuclear laboratories uh, in this space. 
Uh, and before I, I continue, I do want to make it very clear, CNL is Canada's national nuclear laboratory, and we're not designing a specific reactor. Uh, our function is, as a national lab uh, is to really support industry uh, and to support uh, the needs of the federal government and provide that expertise. Uh, so we're, we're working with many different vendors, many different utilities uh, to do this. So right to the very basics, of course, uh, when we're talking about nuclear power, we're really focusing in here on fission power. Uh, and this is the process of uh, uh, fissioning uh, large atoms, typically uranium-235 as a fissile, fissile uh, atom, bombarded with a neutron, splits apart, uh, producing a little bit of heat and a few neutrons. And the role of a nuclear reactor is to harness this reaction uh, to produce heat that can be then harnessed to produce electricity or can use that thermal heat directly. So the cartoon here is a cutaway of a can-do style nuclear plant with fuel here up uh, in the core region. And you can see uh, really other than that core component, the rest of this power plant is essentially the same as any thermal power plant, coal plant or natural gas. Uh, you use the heat from that core to uh, boil water, produce steam. Uh, and the rest is very similar. So then the recipe for a nuclear reactor, uh, you need a few key ingredients. Uh, you need fuel, uh, typically that's uranium, but it could be plutonium, thorium. A moderator, that's to slow neutrons down in a thermal reactor and increase the chances that they'll interact and uh, create that, um, that uh, fission reaction. Uh, typically it's water, it could be graphite uh, in, in the moderator. Uh, you need a coolant to extract heat from the core. Again, typically water, but it could be other things, and we'll talk more about that. And you need something to control the rate of those reactions, and that's control rods uh, with uh, neutron absorbing materials like boron or cadmium. With that mix of different ingredients, you can make uh, many different types of reactors. I mentioned water reactors. They very much are the most prevalent technology today for uh, producing nuclear energy at scale. Uh, I looked up the, the most recent numbers and it's basically 95% of the power reactors that are running today are water cooled in one of these three flavors, uh, PWRs, BWRs, or CANDU reactors, also called pressurized heavy water reactors. And I think it's something that everyone should be aware of in Canada uh, and something that I'm particularly proud of that Canada is one of a very small number of countries that have produced their own domestic industry with our own domestic design, uh, the CANDU reactor design. The novel thing there, of course, is it is using water, but it's using heavy water, which is extremely efficient at slowing down neutrons, which allows a, a CANDU reactor to use natural uranium rather than enriched uranium. Uh, overall, out of the 400 some reactors in the world today, um, you know, 95% are water cooled. And overall, we see about 10% of the world's primary electricity supply being supplied by nuclear. This is a sizable fraction, but uh, you know, it's 10% of that overall global demand for electricity. So I'd like to introduce what an SMR is. Um, it is what it sounds like, small modular reactors. Uh, small in the sense of up to about 300 megawatts electric. For context, that is about a third the size of a large, typical, uh, conventional water-cooled power reactor. Uh, it could be much smaller. So in some cases, SMRs go right down to what we call micro-reactor uh, with a handful of megawatts uh, output. Modular can refer to a couple of different things. Modular in terms of how the modules are created to be uh, connected together somewhat like Lego blocks to produce these reactors that enables factory fabrication and, and lower cost. There's also a concept of modularity to have multiple reactors at a given site. So you can add reactors as your power demands grow. And these are reactors. These are uh, fission reactors utilizing typically uranium based fuels. Uh, one of the key pieces to note about SMRs, however, is that they are right from conception, more meant to be more versatile than a conventional plant um, with applications, including, of course, electricity production, but also the potential to use heat from these reactors 
to drive industrial processes, to be used to produce hydrogen, uh, or as part of uh, integrated energy systems or hybrid energy systems. We were talking a little bit before the lecture, and one of the ideas here is, of course, how do you couple these nuclear technologies right from the beginning with renewables so they can work together and you get more than the sum of the parts? So what are advanced reactors? So advanced reactors uh, is, is kind of a nebulous term. It can mean many things. Effectively, advanced reactors incorporate the latest next generation designs. Uh, and you can have water-cooled reactors that are deemed advanced reactors. But usually when we talk about advanced reactors, we're talking about reactors that incorporate other coolants other than water. So these would be molten salt reactors, sodium fast reactors, uh, or gas cooled reactors. Um, there are many different concepts out there um, that incorporate innovative fuel designs, things like triso based fuels or molten salt fuels where the fuels actually dissolved within the coolant salt. Uh, all typically include higher temperatures in their designs. This enables the use of uh, fairly high temperature process heat directly from these reactors to uh, look to decarbonize heavy industry. And uh, in most cases, these concepts include innovative fuel cycles uh, that contemplate the potential for recycling uh, and also include the idea of fueling a reactor that could last for perhaps 5, 10, or even in some cases 20 years between refueling. That contrasts against existing light water reactors that would typically be refueled in the 18 to 24 month range. Um, advanced reactors can be small, they can be large, uh, and I would point to the Generation 4 International Forum, which has been working on advanced reactors. There are six internationally recognized systems under Gen 4 that have been worked for something like 20 years. Uh, to define these systems more fully as example cases and drive R&D and innovation. Uh, Canada is involved with three of those six systems and CNL uh, actually sits on those committees uh, collaborating with uh, other nuclear labs around the world. So in the landscape uh, in, of reactors in Canada today, um, before I, I kind of share the latest of what's going on, I do want to note that time is, is fairly short when it comes to energy infrastructure. Um, Canada has ambitious goals related to net zero by 2050 and even more uh, ambitious goal of net zero electricity grid by 2035. Uh, in all the credible models that I've seen on, on how to achieve this practically, there's a, a need for extremely rapid rollout of more uh, electrical generation capacity. Uh, something like two to three X, two to three times the amount of uh, electricity to be produced on the grid by 2050 to come close to meeting these goals. Uh, that's driven in part by trying to decarbonize the transport sector, whether that be through battery electric vehicles or scaling up massive production of hydrogen or other synthetic clean fuels. Uh, and industrial decarbonization is another uh, key driver here. Again, needing more electricity or more potential to use direct process heat from advanced reactors or other sources. Uh, and I think the point of this is just to say that no single technology is likely to be able to achieve all of these goals. Uh, and so you really do need to throw everything at the problem, um, including, I think, uh, and I submit to you, uh, advanced reactors and small modular reactors. The figure here on the, the slide is from the Canadian Energy Regulator and just shows the current state today. Uh, electricity currently is about 17% of our, our primary energy use in Canada. So that means that over 80% of what we use today comes from other sources, uh, the large majority being oil and natural gas. So while we need to scale up electricity production, uh, that's absolutely true, we also need to find ways to reduce the use of these, uh, these other fuels um, and replace what they're currently doing for us, which is in many cases heating our homes, heating our, uh, our schools, uh, and providing uh, fuel for our transportation fleets. And I think that SMRs and advanced reactors can play a key role here. 
So Canada uses many different forms of energy. We have different requirements. Um, on this slide, I'd like to kind of focus in on three particular areas that I see as uh, uh, areas that SMRs and advanced reactors could really contribute in. Uh, in northern Canada today, there are something like 200 communities that are reliant on diesel fuel for their electricity production. While these may not be the lead application for micro SMRs, they certainly have some potential to be decarbonized through these advances. Uh, these are some of the more challenging places to use renewables uh, in locations that are dark for months at a time, for example. Uh, but there's a real need to look for opportunities to find uh, clean energy solutions in these uh, small communities. Uh, and so that's a, a driver for some of the developments in the micro reactor space. Resource extraction industries may be more of a lead role to deploy SMRs. Uh, these resource extraction industries, uh, oil sands, mining sites, um, uh, various mineral extraction sites, utilize a fairly substantial amount of electricity and thermal power. Today, that's predominantly supplied by either natural gas that's available nearby or by diesel. So again, this is an opportunity uh, as far as a, a fairly substantial market here in Canada for these technologies, uh, SMRs and advanced reactors. Uh, I would point to one recent you know, example, uh, an analysis done uh, looking at Alberta's needs for thermal power in the coming years, try to work towards decarbonization. And the estimates range um, depending on the scenario, but we're talking into the 30, 40, gigawatts thermal capacity to be able to generate um, the kinds of extraction that is, is required to supply the feedstock that we get from the oil sands, for example, to use that oil for other, um, other high value products, pharmaceuticals, plastics, and, and others that are difficult to do otherwise. So there's an enormous need there. And of course, low carbon energy that goes onto our grid um, Every province is a little bit different makeup of uh, how they produce electricity and, uh, and energy today. Uh, some are very lucky. Uh, so British Columbia and Manitoba, for example, have enormous reserves of hydroelectric power. But uh, there are other jurisdictions that really have very few options to uh, decarbonize at scale. So example of Alberta and Saskatchewan, are currently very much reliant on fossil fuels. Larger grid-enabled SMRs, perhaps up to that 300 megawatt electric uh, size, are actually very well sized to replace um, coal-fired generation uh, and fit well within smaller grids. So uh, gigawatt class reactors might be too big for a place like Saskatchewan, for example. Uh, all of Saskatchewan is about a million people, so it, it's a fairly diffuse population with a few key centers, uh, and they need a, a solution um, to climate change as well. The other thing that I'd point to is uh, the emerging realization that even small reactors may not be able to add up to enough generation. And I think this starts getting into uh, the discussion around how could we use larger reactors. Uh, in a study on decarbonization pathways that was released in December, the IESO, uh, Independent Electricity System Operator here in Ontario, noted in their decarbonization scenario new nuclear up to around 18 gigawatts electric would be required by 2050 to reach those decarbonization goals for Ontario. Uh, that's larger than the current fleet of nuclear reactors that we have in Ontario today, just as an example. Uh, it's likely that SMRs can play an important part of that, but you may need large reactors as well. So there's been a lot of activity on SMRs over the last five plus years in Canada. Uh, try to give a little bit of a uh, tour of the different aspects here and key players. Um, an SMR action plan was issued back in 2020. Uh, this is at this link here. Um, this website summarizes uh, over 100 different organizations uh, commitments and actions to move towards deploying SMRs in Canada. Last I checked, there was over 500 specific actions from federal departments, from provincial uh, crown corporations and utilities, from private sector companies, uh, and from labs, from, uh, from various different uh, sections of society 
who see SMRs as an important piece of the puzzle here. Uh, this was building on the SMR roadmap that was issued back in 2018. And Canada is actually seen internationally as a real leader here. Um, the work that was done and convened by the federal government to bring stakeholders together and talk through how would we deploy these reactors, uh, how do we get the right kind of uh, designs, the sort of market-led approach uh, has, has been a model that others in international fora talk about and uh, look to Canada as a, as a real leader in this space. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, CNSC, that's the regulator for, uh, for reactor technology and, and nuclear in Canada. Uh, they have a vendor design review process. This is a pre-licensing process, but there are already 12 SMR vendors that are taking part of that process today. They're at various stages, uh, and that helps those vendors uh, confirm that their designs are meeting the intent of CNSC regulation. CNSC gets a chance to provide them feedback before they enter into formal uh, design reviews. The industry is also a really active participant here in SMRs and advanced reactors. Uh, there are a lot of different designs of SMRs out there. I think the IAEA compendium lists something like 100 different designs that exist in the world today. As I mentioned, there's 12 that are active in Canada. So uh, the industry has started talking about reactors, uh, these new reactors, in three distinct streams to keep it a uh, simpler story to, to explain. So stream one is uh, grid scale reactors. These are the larger 300 megawatt electric type reactors. And Ontario Power Generation right now is working towards an initial deployment of one of these types of units. They announced uh, that they will be building a BWRX um, 300 reactor. This is by GE Hitachi, that's the, the vendor. Uh, their aim is to site that at the Darlington site and build that, get it on the grid uh, later this decade. And that will be the very first implementation of, of a larger grid scale SMR in Canada and one of the first in the entire world, really. Sask Power, uh, based in Saskatchewan, has also announced that they're looking at SMRs to deploy in Saskatchewan. Uh, and they're looking to follow in the lead of OPG uh, and will make a decision later this decade if they're going to move ahead. If they do, they're looking at multiple units in Saskatchewan using the BWRX 300 design. In stream two, we get into some more advanced reactor concepts that incorporate fuel recycling uh, and different innovative concepts. Um, this is really an exciting space. New Brunswick Power uh, is taking a real leadership role here and are working with two vendors, uh, Moltex and Arc. The Moltex technology is, uh, is a waste burning um, molten salt reactor. So that their reference concept would take can do spent fuel process it and put it into that reactor and use that, that spent fuel as their uh, fuel for the reactor. Uh, the ARC reactor is a sodium cooled fast reactor concept that would be fueled up once and then run uh, steady for 20 years. Uh, both are, are in development now with New Brunswick Power looking to site these uh, towards either the end of this decade or early into the 2030s. And then stream three, these are micro reactors, so very small SMRs, uh, typically below 15 megawatt electric in terms of the overall size. Uh, and there are a couple of them that are in, uh, in process of moving towards demonstrations here in Canada. The furthest along is the Global First Power Project at Chalk River Labs, where, uh, where I work. Uh, and they're looking to site that reactor at Chalk River. They're already initiating uh, siting reviews with uh, CNSC. Uh, and they aim to site that reactor later this decade. So I won't go through this slide in, in all detail, but I wanted to kind of indicate in general um, that there's a real Team Canada approach to SMRs and advanced nuclear in, in Canada. And there's various segments of, uh, of the industry from different uh, stakeholder groups that are working on this. Uh, so I, I wanted to note in particular, the federal government, through this action plan that I mentioned, has really convened people. Uh, the federal government also has a really unique role in Canada to uh, bring to the forefront these ideas and provide certain levels of funding. Um, it is not, however, the federal government's role to pick technologies or to, uh, or to decide on a province's energy solution. So 
the federal government has actually uh, a major landmark in 2022 included SMRs along with funding in the federal budget. This is the first time that we saw uh, the word SMR and, uh, and money associated with it in a federal budget document. So that's a major milestone. Um, there have been other funding uh, uh, programs through the federal government, including the Strategic Innovation Fund that has funded uh, at least three different SMR vendors for early phase research. And then most recently this past fall, uh, Ontario Power Generation received a uh, almost $1 billion uh, low interest rate loan from the Canadian Infrastructure Bank to move forward that uh, BWRX 300 project that I mentioned. So that's some real uh, leadership here uh, from the federal government. On the provincial government side, there are at least four provinces that are really championing nuclear. Uh, there's Ontario, which today relies on nuclear for 60% of our electricity, so that's no surprise. There's New Brunswick, who also has a, a CANDU reactor operating today. Saskatchewan, who are interested in the potential for these reactors uh, to decarbonize their largely fossil-based grid, and Alberta. Uh, and so those four provinces uh, developed an MOU and worked collaboratively to put out a strategic plan last year. And in all cases, they're uh, fairly bullish on the idea that SMRs could be incorporated within those provinces as part of an energy mix to decarbonize. This is, of course, critical, as I say, because provinces have to be on board. At the end of the day, uh, energy policy is a provincial matter. The industry is not uh, sitting on the sidelines. The, the nuclear industry has a role to play to bring expertise to bear uh, and to help inform uh, and advocate for solutions. So through mechanisms like the CANDU Owners Group, um, utilities, labs, uh, and academia can work together to bring forward uh, solutions. Much of the regulatory infrastructure and much of the um, thinking in Canada has been focused on can-do reactors historically, but, uh, but that's going to change if we see these new concepts come to fruition. And last but not least, the National Laboratory. So CNL has a role to play here to enable and advance SMRs and advanced reactor concepts. Again, we're not developing any one technology. We're here to help uh, all of them. We have federal research programs to develop our uh, expertise and facilities. We do work commercially for SMR vendors. Uh, we're actually offering up our site as an area where vendors could come and test their reactors. And we're uh, getting active into collaborations, well plugged into international collaborations happening in the world uh, and academic partnerships. So a few thoughts on advantages and limitations of nuclear that strike me as I, as I am close to this subject. There are clearly a few uh, major advantages and opportunities uh, for, for new nuclear SMRs and advanced reactors. Uh, once you've built a plant, this is extremely reliable infrastructure that runs essentially 24 seven with high predictability, high capacity factor. Uh, that's crucial as we go forward and expand our grids. This is low carbon uh, source of, of energy, uh, really nuclear when you, when you look at the details of life cycle greenhouse gas uh, analysis, you can find that it's amongst the lowest of all uh, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions on par with things like wind and solar. Very high energy density is, is sort of the core reason for this. Um, you don't need all that much material to produce these huge amounts of power from nuclear. Uh, whereas when you look at other options, you need a lot of mined materials, a lot of construction, uh, a lot of uh, things like copper and other materials. I put cost effective and that might be provocative because some people would say and point back to cost overruns for nuclear and that has historically happened on occasion, which is true of course uh, any major uh, large scale infrastructure project that runs into billions of dollars. But once built, nuclear power plants can operate uh, for many years in a very reliable cost effective manner. Today on the grid in Ontario, the lowest cost energy we have is from nuclear, uh, these established plants that uh, just work. And perhaps uh, this should, should have been in the top bullet. Um, ever since the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, this has become kind of a top of mind. But energy security in general is something that uh, should be considered as part of energy policy explicitly. Uh, and nuclear can enhance 
energy security. Uh, it is fairly straightforward to have years worth of fuel located at a nuclear site. Uh, and that gives you a lot of stability in terms of energy costs. You're not as reliant on inputs and uh, imports of uh, fuel from external sources. Some of the perceived limitations or challenges, I think there's a lot of fair points that are brought up and I wanted to address a few um, sort of head on. Uh, high upfront costs, this is absolutely a, a major challenge for large infrastructure projects in general and nuclear is not immune from that. Uh, the idea behind SMRs is to actually reduce that size of the reactor uh, from something that is um, fairly enormous to something that's more manageable and bite-sized. Uh, that reduces the cost of uh, uh, smaller capital outlay, uh, faster payback period, uh, and what's particularly interesting about the concept of SMRs and factory fabrication is that you could move towards a paradigm of um, reducing costs with economies of multiple rather than economies of scale. So uh, that's where you learn and you build these reactors and after you get to your nth of a kind, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth reactor, you bring those costs you know, substantially down from first of a kind. Traditionally, many reactors have been built uh, as a sort of custom uh, one of a kind reactor and uh, that's not a recipe for, for cost effective uh, project. Waste management is always brought up and it's a fair uh, a fair question, right? It's a really important question. But I do want to note that nuclear has a few advantages when it comes to waste. The waste is extremely well characterized. It's relatively small. And while it could pose a public safety hazard if it wasn't managed, it is extremely well managed. And we have solutions. So I would point in Canada to some real leadership. Canada is really at a forefront here uh, amongst a few countries in the world that have a, a very credible plan for dealing with spent fuel waste. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization is working towards a deep geological repository. We're about a couple years away from them making their final announcements. Um, they're following internationally recognized best practices to engage with communities, find willing host sites, and follow the science. So the science says the best route to disposition uh, spent fuel waste is deep geologic repositories. And the science says that the way to do this is to get community buy-in and engagement, which does take years and years. And so they're continuing to work that process and get uh, the public educated and working with them to find a solution. Uh, perhaps the only advanced uh, economy that's sort of further along in this journey is Finland, and they're also working to a very similar solution. Uh, and so there is a path to, to dealing with spent fuel, uh, and Canada's a leader in this area. Um, so that's an important point that maybe people don't always appreciate. Public perception of nuclear is mixed. Uh, it's interesting to note, perhaps because of energy security questions or because of our goals to meet net zero, Canada has a fairly positive view. Uh, in recent public polling, we see almost 60% of Canadians are in favor of building new nuclear. I think that's uh, indicative uh, of uh, people being willing to see that it's nuclear and renewables, not uh, one or the other, uh, that are required to help us decarbonize our grids. Uh, fuel availability is another significant constraint, and I think it's an important one for us to elaborate a little on here. Um, there are finite supplies of uranium, just as there's finite supplies of other critical materials. As prices go up for uranium, you're certainly going to find other economic deposits. But the reality is that you know, there are certain finite amounts. There's hundreds and hundreds of years of uranium at current utilization rates that are in known reserves. It's very possible that we'll find much more as we typically do when prices go up. Uh, but there are also some really attractive potential innovations that are being designed right now in some of these advanced reactors to utilize recycling technologies uh, for closed fuel cycles. So fast reactor technologies can make use of the amounts of uh, stored nuclear fuel that we have that are uh, used nuclear fuel uh, from candy reactors, for example, or this next generation of uh, small modular reactors. And last, you know, safety and public engagement. Um, it's again important to note that nuclear sometimes gets uh, painted with a broad brush to say, well, there's, there have been accidents, and there absolutely have been uh, a couple of very high profile accidents that get a lot of attention. 
But when you look into the details, uh, it's very um, important to put that into context, that every energy generation technology has pros and cons, uh, and actually in absolute numbers and an absolute uh, you know, incredible fact is that nuclear has the absolute safest record of any reactor or any technology uh, for producing massive amounts of electricity. So this is a technology that uh, should continue to be scrutinized and look for improvements, but is already today the safest form of energy generation. One of the kind of big criticisms that I have heard about the potential for nuclear to help with energy sustainability uh, and decarbonization is could nuclear be built quickly enough to make a difference? And I think that's another really fair question because these are big projects that cost a lot of money that take a lot of time to build. Um, but I think the answer is yes, unambiguously, we could build these out fast. And the reason we know that there's at least three uh, highly relevant examples, Ontario is one, uh, Sweden's another good one, and France, I think, is maybe the best possible example to point out. And so uh, this is one of sort of two charts that I have uh, in this presentation. France made a decision in the 1970s that they would go nuclear in a big way to, uh, to have more um, stability of their electricity grid and get them off of massive amounts of imported uh, oil. And so what this chart shows is the cumulative capacity in gigawatts over time that were added to the, the French grid. They went from zero to 60 gigawatts in the span of a little more than uh, 20 years. That's an incredible scale up that at peak, they were adding almost five gigawatts of new uh, electric capacity from nuclear on their grid every year. Uh, so to replicate something like that, you know, certainly we know it's been done, we know it's possible. Uh, this required an enormous will from, uh, from the French government fairly substantial investments, uh, but the fact that it has been done before helps us have some confidence that it could be done again. And I bring this example up again because I think this is the kind of scale of investment and the kind of scale of decision that would have to be made at sort of national and provincial levels to really move the needle on, uh, on climate change obligations that we're making. Okay, so with that preamble, I, I want to jump into some examples of the work that we're doing at Canadian Nuclear Labs uh, in the adjacent spaces and directly on SMRs and advanced reactors. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about CNL and, and then dive into some examples, but before I jump into it, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say we have a team of about 700 researchers and technologists within our S&T organization in CNL and we are absolutely growing and growing rapidly. Uh, we're hiring well over 100 people per year and we continue to see that into the near, in the near future. And so uh, if you're interested in anything I talk about here, please come and, and chat with me or, or check us out on our website. So as a national lab, our goals are to meet our commitments to Canadians. Um, we have three major uh, high-level missions. One is on environmental stewardship, so that's cleaning up legacy sites, that is uh, environmental-based research. There's clean energy, which I'm going to talk a whole bunch more about now, uh, and there's public health. So what's not covered in my talk uh, here is touching on isotope-related research or other medical advancements, which are, you know, uh, very fascinating and, and super important areas. Uh, but really, our overarching aim at CNL is to ensure science is able to confront the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, I was chatting with someone right before my talk about some of the investments being made in CNL, and this tries to capture on one slide some of the incredible work that's being done to modernize the site. Chalk River is about two hours west of uh, Ottawa, and it is the birthplace of the CANDU reactor technology. Some of the facilities that we still have at the site are somewhat dated. And so the, the government, the federal government, realized uh, back about 10 years ago that there'd need to be some improvements made at the Chalk River site. So over the last uh, seven or eight years, we've torn down well over 100 dated uh, old buildings, and we've cleared room to, produce, to uh, actually build some new state-of-the-art facilities. So we just broke ground on a, a brand new uh, 
building called the Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Center, ANMRC. This is going to be a cutting edge a materials test facility that has uh, hot cells for fuel and materials and material characterization labs that will continue to serve the needs of the current fleet uh, and this emerging SMR fleet that we're talking about. Um, so a couple of pictures here of our site uh, with these three uh, buildings with arrows, you know, brand new buildings that are either under construction or nearing completion now. Within CNL, we're organized into uh, five big directorates. The titles are pretty self-explanatory, but reactor fleet sustainability is all about keeping the current fleet running, uh, developing new tooling, uh, emergent uh, support work. Uh, advanced reactors is, is, is my directorate, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Hydrogen and tritium technologies, this uh, directorate has capabilities in storage, in um, hydrogen production and in other isotopes of hydrogen, including deuterium and tritium management technologies. Safety and security touches on cybersecurity, instrumentation control system, nuclear detection and forensics, and isotopes, radiobiology and environment is really where we house our, our um, research on health effects of uh, low doses of radiation and isotope related research. So how, are we enabling SMRs and advanced reactors? Well, it's through major funding programs that we have in place, uh, federal research, which I'll talk a little more about, work that we do for commercial entities. We are open for business to do work with uh, SMR vendors or utilities, and we regularly do that kind of work. We have a demonstration program that's uh, hosting the GFP project at the Chalk River site, but we're open to, to hosting other SMRs to help them demonstrate their technologies. And we're developing our Clean Energy Demonstration Innovation and Research Initiative, or CEDAR Initiative, which is about integration of nuclear and renewables together. So under advanced reactors, we do work for 14 different departments and agencies in government. Uh, these are the sort of science-based uh, departments and agencies. And there's a lot of work that we do uh, across a, a huge number of topics. I've tried to consolidate this into one slide to give you a flavor. Uh, in materials and chemistry, you know, understanding corrosion behavior of advanced materials, materials that are going to be used as structural uh, alloys within uh, advanced reactors at 1,000 degrees Celsius under harsh conditions, for example. Uh, reactor safety research, both large-scale experiments to understand phenomena that are occurring within uh, a severe accident scenario, and the modeling that goes along with that. Nuclear fuels, we're developing characterization techniques for uh, fuels of the future. Uh, characterization, prototyping, and fuel qualification work underway now. In energy systems research, we are certainly working on this CEDAR concept, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but we're also doing economic analysis, fuel cycle analysis, and other long-term advanced reactor research that is, is very much next generation. Uh, for example, there's early phase work underway for space-based reactors. And all of this is underpinned with advanced codes and modeling. So developing codes uh, that are used by the nuclear industry, but also uh, leveraging existing tools to do new types of analysis. So I'll cite a couple of examples in the next couple slides here. So some examples of materials and chemistry work that we're doing in the lab today, um, again, addressing a, a large swath of the different advanced reactor technologies that are, uh, that are being developed. Uh, molten salt loop that's under construction uh, to examine essentially corrosion behavior under flowing conditions with a natural circulation molten salt loop. We're starting out with uh, coolant salt, so this does not include any uh, fuel material at the moment, but in future this could be scaled to include fuel salt. Um, high temperature creep rigs that we've developed to be able to do testing up to a thousand degrees Celsius to understand the limits of uh, the performance of uh, the structural alloys that are planned to be used for advanced reactors. And corrosion testing under uh, prototypic conditions. So these reactors that I'm talking about, high temperature gas reactors for example, We'll be using helium as a coolant. This is an inert gas. Uh, but in many cases, different levels of impurities could cause corrosion 
in those, uh, in those systems. So understanding the limits under uh, watering grass or uh, with other impurities is, is crucial. In reactor safety, a new facility that we've developed to examine uh, uh, aerosol behavior under severe accidents uh, is pictured on the left. This is our strong condensation containment apparatus. We can actually run this, uh, this facility, which is taller than this uh, lecture hall, uh, to create the prototypic environment of a severe accident in a water-cooled reactor, and then measure aerosol deposition on the cooler walls of the secondary containment. This allows us to do high fidelity measurements and then validate uh, reactor safety containment analysis codes, uh, which is crucial to get confidence that those codes are producing uh, reasonable results. We're developing new test facilities. So what's pictured in the middle here is uh, a coupled loop passive safety facility uh, that we're going to be building uh, and developing advanced measurement techniques. So this is leveraging the best uh, of advanced measurement technique capabilities and applying that into these uh, reactor safety experiments, particle image velocimetry, optical fiber, temperature sensors, uh, and, and others to create high fidelity data that is then used for validating the high fidelity modeling that's done today. And on that topic of modeling, uh, more and more we're, we're looking at coupled codes. So this is coupling computational fluid dynamics with system thermohydraulics and reactor uh, um, physics models. Uh, in conventional reactors, the 1D assumption that you use in system thermohydraulics models is actually pretty good. Uh, but more and more as you shrink these reactors down, three-dimensional effects become extremely important. And so uh, this work that we're doing, we're doing in conjunction with partners at Idaho National Lab. We have our own in-house thermohydraulics codes and we're using industry uh, best uh, CFD codes to be able to couple these together and model the system. Uh, nuclear, and fuel, nuclear fuel and physics uh, is, is another crucial area where we have many capabilities. I've highlighted a couple here. Uh, we do have one reactor that operates still at the Chalk River site. This is our Z2 zero power reactor. Uh, this has been used historically uh, as, as part of sort of developing the can-do reactor concept to do physics analysis uh, of different fuel types under different conditions. It's not necessarily obvious that you could use such a, a heavy water moderated zero power reactor to do analysis and, and experiments that's relevant to various advanced reactor concepts that are very, very different. But actually in simulations uh, that we've completed recently, it in indicates a lot of feasibility here. Um, to be able to apply those physics results from work in Z2 to these uh, other reactor types. So we're exploring that further and we're in commercial discussions with a, an SMR vendor today to use that facility for, uh, for doing physics work to confirm their calculations. Um, we have new measurement capabilities we're bringing online all the time. Uh, a recent example is our new uh, 3D X-ray computed tomography facility that we're using for fuel characterization. What's imaged in the middle here is a triso fuel particle, about the size of a poppy seed. Uh, so this is a fairly high resolution, uh, three-dimensional imaging technique that can be done non-destructively to confirm that the coating layers that are applied to these very small kernels of uranium fuel are intact and, uh, and behaving as expected. And, and last pictured here is uh, some breadth of expertise that we have in the lab that's fairly unique most uh, other labs do not have the ability to handle the range of materials that we can uh, at Canadian nuclear laboratories. So that includes, of course, a, a wide range of uranium-based fuels. We can also handle uh, plutonium and other uh, actinides. Uh, what I'm talking about here is really HALU fuel, which is uh, high assay, low enriched uranium fuel. HALU is, is the reference fuel concept for many of the uh, SMRs that are being uh, designed today. And we have all the capabilities in-house to handle those fuels uh, and produce them at lab scale. I mentioned our commercial work. So we're doing work with uh, all of these vendors listed here through a cost shared program called uh, Canadian Nuclear Research Initiative. It's been very successful so far. Over the last uh, three years, we've worked with many SMR vendors and continue to do so. 
so a, a lot more work to be done. Um, I've mentioned our, our siting uh, invitation process. Global First Power is furthest along in this process. We, again, aren't picking which reactors are being built on the Chalk River site. We're really looking at enabling any vendor who wants to design a reactor to, to move forward, and we can offer our site up. We've done as much as we can to our site to characterize uh, likely locations uh, and do baseline environmental studies to enable them. Uh, Global First Power is really moving ahead at pace. They have applications in with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission now and are working on their environmental assessment. So we expect that would be the first mover reactor uh, in the micro reactor space built in Canada. Okay, in the last segment of my talk here, I wanna talk a little bit about um, our CEDAR initiative. So CEDAR is, is sort of our vision of how nuclear and renewable uh, research could be done uh, at the Chalk River site. And I think increasingly we're thinking about how we leverage partnerships and collaborations with universities to do you know, major parts of this work at universities uh, while, while kind of focusing in at CNL on some of the more nuclear specific aspects. Um, it's a way to conduct research, to pave the way for these different technologies and provide some demonstration platforms to industry. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little further here on you know, why do we think this is important? Well, I think the case is uh, we need some all options approach that incorporates nuclear with other energy generation options. Um, and we see this as an important way to prove out technical sort of side of the equation, which is of course important, but I think even perhaps more important is demonstration projects can help show the economic viability of these different uh, concepts that we're talking about, um, prove out that our modeling is in the realm of kind of reasonable numbers, uh, and in the space of touching on nuclear technologies, showing to a regulator that you can do this at a regulated site uh, will really support policy and uh, regulatory development. First-of-a-kind projects, when you're dealing with the regulator, take a little bit longer. You have to work through first-of-a-kind questions. Once you've proven that you can do something, uh, coupling a, a nuclear reactor to hydrogen production, for example, you can imagine that is then something that's applicable elsewhere. And of course, social license, uh, public and stakeholder engagement is another key area that we plan to uh, address with this program. We're currently doing work now in the lab, uh, and so I think there's a lot on the go today that we are able to actually uh, collaborate on and work with partners. We're doing modeling work of overall systems, uh, lab scale R&D of thermal energy storage systems and microgrids. And we're doing that work largely through our federal program, but also in consultation with, uh, with commercial stakeholders. And all that work that we're doing in the lab today, uh, it isn't really explicitly tied into an SMR. So we're not waiting to build an SMR to do that lab scale work and modeling. That's kind of already in progress. But we do have a vision of a grander Cedar Park in the future uh, in parallel with SMR deployment to demonstrate coupling of energy systems with the heat and electricity from an SMR. Uh, and we see this as an important step to decarbonize uh, the operations at the Chalk River site. So the current scope of work in our lab component of this research touches on uh, hybrid energy system optimization modeling. That's a system that we've built at, at CNL to analyze overall energy grids. Um, hydrogen and clean fuels research, cybersecurity and remote operation, nuclear enabled microgrids, and thermal energy storage systems uh, are just a few of the areas that we're focused on right now. We're building capabilities uh, and doing work to focus on uh, understanding how clean energy technologies each work independently and then moving to integrate those together. This is just an example of our hybrid energy system optimization model to give you a sense of the things that it incorporates within that, uh, within that model. Uh, we essentially can define a one year scenario where we define electricity and thermal requirements. And then we allow the system to run and uh, optimize for the mix of uh, energy generation technologies and storage options that would give us an optimal minimum cost or minimum greenhouse gas emissions. And so we can enable or, or disable various different uh, storage types or different energy generation options uh, to analyze different scenarios. 
And so this has been a, a very useful tool for us. There are other tools out there that, uh, that are used in industry. Uh, we use them as well. In many cases, they don't actually include nuclear or they don't include nuclear to sufficient um, uh, detail that you can implement the correct kinds of uh, constraints that you have in nuclear. It's not true that you can just flip a nuclear reactor on and off. There are real constraints around ramp rates uh, and around uh, how much time you have in between shutting a reactor down and being able to restart it, for example. So those are considered explicitly in our models. To give you an example of what this kind of looks like, um, here's just a, a scenario that, that we modeled for a given generation mix that we needed to produce a certain amount of electricity and, and thermal power over a year, always being able to meet those demands fluctuating day by day. Um, we took a look at what the effect of carbon price would be uh, on that uh, optimal mix to have lowest cost. And you can see on the left-hand side of this chart, this is a scenario with zero carbon price. And you end up with a, a very natural gas dominant system, uh, which is no surprise. As you move up in, in higher and higher carbon prices, as we are set to in, in Canada to move to $170 per ton by 2030, uh, you see that tilt to have more and more um, wind and nuclear on that grid in this, in this particular scenario. And so we've used this, uh, this modeling tool for a number of different feasibility studies working with industry uh, and with stakeholders uh, in the federal government to analyze interesting scenarios to look for pathways to decarbonization. And I'll just profile a couple of them here uh, as a sort of last, uh, last item in my talk. Um, we did work with Ontario Power Generation and a group called Mirarco. And this is a mining research group. Uh, and an actual mining partner. Uh, so this is a mine that's uh, in, in a northern location. We use real world mine data in terms of electricity requirements and heat requirements for that mine over the course of a year uh, on an hourly basis. And we went through and did a, a comprehensive economic feasibility and cost benefit study to examine the potential role of micro reactors. So small modular reactors that are below 15 megawatt electric in that scenario, and it was actually found in, in that type of scenario that uh, very small SMRs would be quite competitive economically. Now, to be fair, they're not talking about grid um, costs for electricity. They're talking about trucking in diesel and burning that in dedicated diesel generators in these remote sites. So their electricity costs are, are about an order of magnitude more than what we pay in, in cities in Canada. But uh, it gave a good sense that this is actually a fairly viable uh, approach for uh, these industrial settings. Another one that I want to profile is the last one on this slide. We've just completed work for uh, Department of National Defense. Uh, DND is also subject to all of these goals we have to, to reach decarbonization uh, in 2050. Um, it's not so straightforward to do such a thing at large uh, military bases that are also reliant on natural gas for heating and diesel for backup power. So uh, we studied the potential for the Petawawa base, which is located right adjacent to Chalk River, to uh, reach some of their goals with uh, two SMR units that might be sited at the Chalk River site, in theory, uh, and run that heat and that electricity to the base. And through that analysis, again, using these modeling tools we've developed, we found that we could really contribute meaningfully to decarbonization of, uh, of their operations at this, uh, at this major military installation. So with that, I hope I, I shed some light on the status and the potential for SMRs and advanced reactors in Canada to help contribute to a sustainable energy future. I'm really happy to take any questions. Thanks. Yeah. 
for the great stuff is that if you walk on the best new material or you can not do this for the because the new material are the creator of the stuff. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, we're never done developing new materials. There's always potential to improve on, on existing materials. CNL right now, we're not in a role of developing new materials so much as analyzing and characterizing the performance of existing materials. Although we certainly are open to working with partners who are interested in, in developing new materials. There's a lot of innovation happening in the nuclear sector for uh, high entropy alloys and other advanced materials and there's real promise there and potential for coupling or a tighter coupling of modeling and then testing. And so I think CNL is in a really good position to support and work with others. We have active programs with um, fairly in-depth modeling capabilities that we have in-house. So uh, molecular dynamics modeling and other sort of first principles modeling that we have capabilities for. We also have rigorous testing capabilities as far as characterization of the performance of these materials, but the development itself of those new materials, others are taking a lead. In Canada, you know, that might be CANMET or more in an academic setting, like universities are, are delving into some interesting new areas. But there's always a need for improved materials. If you could have materials that have, uh, you know, significantly better corrosion uh, resistance, you may open up uh, a design space that isn't available today with some of these molten salt reactors or other advanced reactor concepts. Uh, Nick, do we have any questions online on this? No, not at the moment. Okay. Last time question on this, Richard, go ahead. <coughs> Thank you, Ryan. Uh, that was fascinating. What I want to get back to is the context of technology readiness for SMRs. Right. And you gave an example of the French, uh, the ability of the French uh, government and industry to ramp up from zero megawatts to 60 in just over 20 years. But the technology readiness there was kind of built in because which had been proven based on, I presume, some of the early submarine reactors and mm -hmm. so forth, right. projects that you just named. So the French took 20 years to build up to 60 megawatts with a high technology readiness level, probably eight or nine mm -hmm. on the PRLs there. Now, where do you, with SMR, Yeah, so it's a great question, and I completely agree. Energy transitions take a, a fairly long period of time, and you need to have high TRL technologies to deploy en masse. And so it's not likely to see some really innovative designs be scaled up with hundreds of units uh, you know, this decade. But, uh, but I think the focus of many of these advanced reactor concepts is to get deployment projects in place to show the readiness level, to increase that readiness level to the point where it would be at a commercially viable stage uh, through this decade and into the early 2030s in anticipation of scaling up after that. Now, that said, there are some of these technologies, and you mentioned BWRX 300, where they're at the highest technology readiness level that I think you can have with an SMR in the sense that it's built on proven technology the, the X in the BWRX name means the 10th generation of the BWR technology at GE Hitachi. So while it's a new design, and there are some innovations and some differences from previous designs, it's very much leaning on that heritage of an existing concept that's been built. So, so you know, that one I, I would hesitate to give what my view of what the TRL is, but it's very high compared to some of the other concepts that are still in R&D stages and working towards deployment. Um, the GE Hitachi project uh, with, with Darlington New Build, I believe their stated goal is to deploy that reactor by 2028 at the Darlington site. 
That's helped by the fact that Darlington already has an environmental assessment that was done you know, about a decade, a little more than a decade ago. Um, so they don't have to go through those initial steps. It's already been done. Uh, but that said, you know, they're, they're working at pace now. They put in their uh, construction application license uh, to CNSC back last fall. So they really are, are moving that project about as quick as you can. Uh, and the thought there would be after that first build, we would anticipate there'd be others. And, and from a broader global perspective, there are announcements around in Europe just in the last few weeks that there are potential for up to 70 BWX 300 builds in Poland. Estonia is going that way with BWX 300. There's other jurisdictions that are considering it. In Canada, we're looking at SASC Power potentially rolling out some of these units into the 2030s. So there's a real potential if that's built, uh, you know, as the first unit to see it scale up from there. That's a good question. I, I don't have a, a clear view of that. My understanding is uh, you know, a very significant fraction of the overall build could be done by the supply chain in Canada. I think there's a handful of kind of major large components that may or may not be able to be done here for the initial build, right? I'm not sure. Um, like the reactor pr pressure vessel, for example, is, is the major component that I'm thinking of. But most of the rest of the, the uh, components in that reactor share a lot of similarities with CANDU and with the $25 billion refurbishment process that's going on for Ontario's fleet right now, we do have a supply chain here in Canada that's basically tooled up and running at full steam right now. So there's a real opportunity to switch over from components for these existing refurbishment projects to support new builds, whatever those new builds might be. Online questions? Nothing. Back to in-person audience. Colin has one. I was uh, asked by our tech team to please use the mic if you're asking questions for recording purposes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Ali, and thanks for the, uh, the, the great presentation. My question is more on the policy and regulation side. There's been talk from a number of the political parties about SMNRs not being something that they would support. Um, I was wondering what AECL and CNL see as their position on, on I guess, educating or, or, or persuading uh, the general public and, and by that, the parties that are, that are I guess, for or against SMNR technology? Right. So, so CNL's role is, uh, is really a technical role and we absolutely are doing everything we can from a technical perspective to enable the development of these technologies, but you do need to have a supportive uh, kind of pull uh, for what that technology will be deployed, whether that's a utility partner, whether that's a provincial uh, leadership role. Um, so we're in a position of, of advocating for uh, developing our techniques and technologies and subject matter expertise within CNL to support the deployment of this new industry. Uh, but you know, we're not in a, a role of political advocacy, really. No. Online audience? Nothing, back to in-person. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ali. So I think during your presentation, you have, if there are multiple times that you hint that the, the significant potential of using nuclear to decarbonize industry heat. So I was wondering with regard to the SMR, are there any example reactors that the main targets are just providing high temperature heat except um, instead of electricity? Yeah, thanks for the question. So several of these advanced reactor concepts um, that are active in Canada today, uh, high temperature gas reactors for one, uh, molten salt reactors, and, and really sodium cooled fast reactors, all have much higher temperatures than we have with water cooled reactors. So above 600 degrees Celsius, typically. These could be very attractive for uh, some fairly simple low hanging fruit in the sense of most industrial steam is in the sort of high 500 degree, low 600 degree Celsius range. Uh, that could be used immediately by industrial sites. So we've seen some announcements uh, in North America. Uh, one in the US, Dow Chemical has a, an affiliation with X Energy uh, and their gas cooled reactor technology. 
And there's also been announcements here in Canada with uh, OPG and most, most recently in Alberta, uh, uh, an affiliation with X Energy. I mean, X Energy is, is actively pursuing that, uh, that kind of affiliation. There's other reactor technologies that are also you know, well suitable for that type of temperature range. Uh, so, so I do think those advanced reactor concepts are, are targeting that heat market. Uh, there's a certain amount of electricity we require. It's humongous, <laughs> it's not small, but there's an even bigger thermal market. And so several of these advanced reactor concepts are, are really looking at that market as even a, a primary target for, uh, for decarbonization. Uh, online, nothing. Okay. So I guess Chris has one question. Thank you for the presentation again. Um, Chris Ford, University of Waterloo, obviously. Um, what uh, do you happen to know? Uh, two questions. First of all, the the area that a, a an SNMR needs, and, or even a micro needs in general. And then my second question is. How long is the process these days for getting it, shall we say, started as far as finding a, a suitable location? Thanks for the question. So, so the footprint itself for, for different reactors, I think it's somewhat dependent on the reactor. But to give you a, a flavor, um, the GFP project at the Chalk River site is a micro reactor. Uh, I believe it's rated for five megawatt electric, 15 megawatt thermal. Uh, the area that they would be taking up would be about the size of a football field. Uh, and that would include the reactor building and the balance of plant. So it's not a very large footprint. Uh, it, it's something that's fairly manageable. You can, you can kind of envision where that would go. Larger reactors actually don't need that much more space than that. Um, you know, the GE Hitachi design, I don't have the latest figures on the overall site footprint, but it's not that much larger. Uh, they do typically require more of an exclusion zone, and that's still to be determined as far as exactly how much space. The Darlington site has lots of space, so, so they're well set up to be able to accommodate almost any reactor. Um, so I hope that kind of answers that, that question in general. Online, nothing? In person? I guess not. Uh, but Ali, I would like to make a few comments from your presentation. Uh, CNL or CEDAR initiative, there are a lot of synergies mm -hmm. when it comes to University of Waterloo and when it comes to your institute, because you name it, neutronics modeling, optimization, algorithm development, prototyping, full-scale commercialization. We have the expertise to collaborate with you guys to do research, development, and commercialization. So I really thank you for your wonderful presentation and thank you so much for sharing some great insights with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much.